Pamela, we are live on YouTube. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, at this time, uh, I would like to reconvene into open session. I'd like to, um, first of all, uh, thank Sandra Barnes for opening um, our original session. I appreciate um, the help on that. So we are reconvening. I've got at 5.01 p.m. on the 20th of May. I'd like to report out that there was uh, one action taken uh, during closed session. And uh, that was, uh, we had two substitute teachers. Is that correct, Dr. Holcomb? Do you need to be, we would like to release uh, uh, at this point? That is correct. And Kim Felder, can, can you give her the verbiage on that? Okay. All right. So it's going to be by a vote of how many were in favor to how many were not. Um, two substitute certificated employees who worked over 75% of the 2019-20 school year were non-reelected as certificated employees effective at the close of the 2019-20 school year. Sorry about that. So what was the vote? I think at this point we failed to take a vote on that. Um, so what I, I think at this point, what I'd like to do is at the conclusion of our open session, do we reconvene back into closed session, take that vote and then come back out? That's what I recommend. Okay, so if we could- Sorry um, about that. that. Yep, no problem, Kim. If we could take that off and um, help us remember, or someone, Kim, if that we need to reconvene into closed session, then uh, 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 take the vote on this and back into open session, then we'll close out after that. So we'll do that at the very conclusion of this meeting. Uh, so, having said that, at this point, there was no action taken in our closed se session. Um, if I could ask uh, perhaps Art Dice, if you would like to lead the Pledge of Allegiance today. Okay. Salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, the United of, America, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Art. I appreciate that. Um, at this point, I'd like to ask, this is the comment section, section five of our agenda today, comments and announcements from board members. Uh, if I could go through it, we'll start with uh, Bill Legron. Any um, comments? I have none, thank you. Uh, Mark Grover. I hope my audio is, is working okay. I, I just want to say how impressed I am with the with the, the team in our district. I, I've been looking at pictures of, uh, of celebrations with teachers and the, the, the staff handing out, taking food out to cars and, and um, I really like this one of uh, all the all the teachers and I just want to thank everybody. This is a really difficult time for everybody in in the world and in our district and 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 teachers and staff across across the country are all learning stuff stuff new and all pulling together in um, unselfish ways and everyone's working together and I just want to thank the whole team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Um, Art? Yes, I have nothing, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Sandra? I, I just wanted to remind everyone that in a normal circumstance, ha ha, um, we would actually be at Central Middle School right now and we would probably be um, honoring our retirees for this year. Um, you know who they are. Unfortunately, I, I thought about this late, so I don't have a list of retirees to honor, but I would like to say and honor them now 
Um, we appreciate you, all of your time, your effort, your service. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, Dr. Holton? Yes, uh, thank you. We will be doing um, in June, our, uh, recognized in our honorees, typically the, the second board meeting in May, we, we do that, but because of our situation, uh, we decided to put it off until June. Um, hoping when we made that decision a month ago that we'd be able to have a, a little more ability to recognize them in person, but I don't think that's going to be the case next month either. But um, nonetheless, yes, we want to recognize those people being, being honored. We'd also, I'd like to recognize CSEA. This week is the Classified uh, um, Appreciation Week, and so we thank all of our uh, CSEA classified employees and all that they do for our, our district. We wanted to let, um, and I don't, I don't want to take John's thunder or Andrew's thunder, but uh, we do have a survey that we would like um, everyone to take, um, parents and staff. We are gearing up towards for next year. And with that comes a lot of uncertainty. We know that uh, yesterday the CDC um, recommended that we um, be very cautious as we look to open up in August and look at um, six feet and um, social distancing and different modes to do playground play and things of that nature. Unfortunately, all those pieces come with extra price tags, which uh, the state nor the district can afford at this point. Um, we're still looking at a, uh, a, an open in August and hopefully some of those requirements will, will be dropped by then. But we are doing a survey asking parents specifically, um, you know, what, what form of education they would prefer in August. Um, we are getting a lot of uh, feedback from our parents I don't know about today, but yesterday after our first day of surveys, we had over 100 surveys returned already. Um, we'll be using that surveys to help us prepare for planning. And we are also looking at um, our traditional open. We're also looking to see how many parents would be open or would actually um, recommend to have a blended or a or continue with the model we have right now with with just all distance learning and so um we're looking at those we'll be looking at those survey results very carefully because we we may be looking at a couple different offerings for parents so that there are at least options for our parents in august so that's all i have to share thank you Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like um, to ask if there are any comments or announcements by administration. Uh, John? Good evening. Um, yeah, just to add, uh, Spencer didn't steal my thunder, but just to add to the, uh, the survey, uh, in addition to the survey, uh, we need that information from uh, our community and our staff. Uh, the county superintendent has created a, a new uh, meeting schedule um, where the entire purpose of that meeting will be to discuss the reopening of schools. Spencer and I will be, both be part of that committee and we'll be meeting once a week with representatives from all other count, all other districts in our county. And we can use this survey data for which many districts are using very similar, if not almost identical surveys so that we can see if we are all, if we are, if our, our communities are all feeling the same or if there are differences and it'll help us plan for what's best for our community and our students and our families. Um, that being said, with all this work going on in this, in this strange environment, we're also still working on, on uh, tr more traditional school endeavors. Um, I'll give you a brief update of the LCAP process changes based on COVID-19. So as you know, typically speaking, next month we would have two board meetings and we'd have a public hearing for the for the budget and the LCAP at the first one, and then we would ask the board for to ratify the the LCAP and the budget at the second meeting. 
because we couldn't possibly meet the LCAP process, both data and, and participa participation requirements this year, um, the state has made several uh, changes to the process. So the first one is, is instead of having an LCAP due in June at the same uh, at the same meeting, the budget is approved. We have to have what's called an operational plan uh, template, which we fill out that the state has sent us, which basically states, how are we educating students? How are we feeding students? And if there was a request for the schools to support supervision of students during regular school hours, uh, how did we respond to that? So we're working on that document now. Uh, that's part one of the LCAP. Part two is they are now gonna have what they're calling LCAP light for the 2021 school year, um, which is basically a one year LCAP plan just for the 2021 school year. That is due uh, in December. That has to be uh, ratified by the board in December. And then come June next year, we have to approve then what was supposed to be the three year plan starting this year. So effectively we'll be doing two separate LCAPs within the same calendar school year next year. Um, it, it, it is easy to see that the legislation has not been able to keep, keep up with all these changes. As an example, uh, when you look at the local indicators that the board approves annually within the, uh, for the California State Dashboard, those are due to be submitted by November 1st. However, they also have legislation that says by Ed Code that they have to be approved at the same meeting as the LCAP which is not until December. So we are gonna be in a position if they don't change the, the legislation that we have to submit our local indicators before they are approved by the board. Um, we anticipate that that language might change, but right now the direction from CDE is get those local indicators done before November 1st, like you're supposed to and submit them and then have the board approved in the following month. Um, we believe that there's a lot going to be a big push to just not have the California State Dashboard for 2020, which would normally come out in December of the school year, because most of the data that would fill that is, no, is going to be unaccessible because we don't have assessments and things that we normally have. But that hasn't been done yet. So we're still having to operate as if it's normal when we know it's not. So we'll have to keep updating the board on those changes and what that changes, how that changes the board's responsibilities and the district meeting schedules and such. A um, Couple other quick notes. Um, uh, next month, the board will have uh, the new contract for iReady to come to the board. iReady has proven to be a valuable distance learning asset to have and so we wanna continue it. Um, so that it's an annual contract. So that will come to the board next month. Um, additionally, uh, we, the district entered into using an online mindfulness program called Inner Explorer this year. We're going to continue that as kind of a breathing exercise for kids to help them calm down and, and maintain this as adults. Um, it's available for teachers to use in their classroom. It's also available for parents to use in an app on any, any smartphone device. Um, that became an app this spring, but it became, it's challenging for us to teach parents how to use it in a distance model. So we're gonna bring that back for next year as well, because we feel like there's gonna be a lot of social emotional learning needs going on as no matter how we start the school year. Because even if by some miracle, we're able to start it in a more traditional mode, we're gonna have kids that haven't gone to school in six months. So they're gonna have a, a quite a transition period as well as the adults. Uh, the last thing I wanted to say is we've been working all year on a middle school science adoption to make sure we have science materials that align to the next generation science standards. We did reach a point where we're ready that we have our science team in consensus on what program they would like to select. So I'm currently working with the um, uh, account representative for that program to get some, uh, what that would cost the district to move forward with that adoption. Um, and once we have a cost, then we'll start deciding if we think in these budget times, if we're able to move forward or if we have to put it on hold, we don't know for sure yet. Um, but uh, I do want to give kudos to our middle school science team for working really hard to pilot a couple of different materials. Even in this uh, distance learning mode, they are still using some of those materials from the, the two different adopt, uh, curriculums they were looking at. So they do a lot, deserve a lot of kudos for, for digging deep and really trying to make the best decision for our students. So that is my report for tonight. John, um, thank you. Um, could, I didn't catch the name of the breathing exercise app. What was that called again? It's called Inner Explorer.
Thank you. Uh, I've lost my place. I, uh, I guess uh, Kimberly Tyler. Um, as the board may remember in December, you approved uh, an application for ESY waiver for two years for this school year and for next school year that was submitted in January. We just received word today that that was approved by the state. We can move forward with ESY being for 13 days. That will be done by distance learning. Due to the situation, we spoke with all of the parents who were involved, gave them the option to continue three more weeks of distance learning or opt out of it this year. Um, about half of the students um, will not be attending this year that normally would attend. Um, so we have only need for reduced staff for ESY. We have one teacher that will be able to provide all of that distance learning support um, through a Google Classroom platform. So I wanted to let you know that we did get that. Um, moving forward and planning, right now one of the biggest concerns we have are our three severely handicapped classrooms. As you know, we have many medically fragile children in those classrooms, some in wheelchairs. Um, as you can imagine, some of the parents are concerned, even with social distancing, about them returning. So we are looking at ways that we can provide uh, additional support um, through a distance learning platform, uh, regardless of how we return. So we're working hard with um, that population. And also our preschool is also a handicapped preschool. Parents have the same concerns. Um, and so this is something that as we move forward through the planning process, we'll have to give special consideration to this student population. And just a point of clarification for the for the board and community, ESY is an acronym for extended school year. And extended school year is exclusively for special education students that um, have that service um, built or um, written into their um, individualized education plan or, or IEP. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Dr. Holton. Uh, Andrew. So I'm gonna share my screen um, for my comments. Uh, hopefully you can see it. The, uh, it's also included in the uh, board agenda. Uh, I have some budget updates and I'm not gonna go into great depth. I wanted to get the big picture out there for you. Um, with the original budget that's coming out in June, I'll go into all these items in much greater detail. Um, so I'm, I went to the school services May revision workshop and many other workshops in the last couple of weeks. Um, and I wanted to share the results. Um, the, the, the key piece to what Governor Newsom has uh, laid out for schools is that uh, even though there is a 2.31 statutory COLA, as you can see there, um, we will be receiving no COLA um, and we're planning on having no COLA for the next three years is what the planning, the, the planning is. Um, in addition to not having COLA, we'll lose an additional um, seven and change percentage to make up to, to create a 10% cut across the board uh, for our LCFF funding. And this will also go for all other state funding that we receive. Um, so the 10%, I'm gonna go back, the 10% cut to put it in, in numbers and, and cents uh, for us is about a $2.4 million a year cut. Um, so when you think about that, that kind of impact on a $28 million budget, uh, it's pretty significant. And that's just the cut to the, the local control funding formula. The other, other trick they're doing, um, and one, one that's gonna take considerable planning and we might talk about short-term borrowing at the end of next year, is they're returning to deferrals. Uh, deferrals are, for example, this June, they owe us about $2 million in June for LCFF. They're not gonna pay us in June. They're gonna pay us 
sometime in July. Uh, this allows the state to close their books with a positive fund balance, which they're required to do, and effectively take a short-term loan from their friends at California Public Schools. Uh, we have no say in it. We get no interest. Uh, so, so we'll be able to weather the the one the one time June 2020 to July 2020 deferral. Uh, we've been watching cash carefully, and we're in an excellent fina financial position to be able to weather this first deferral without any other changes. The second proposed deferral is to to defer three months, or effectively five million dollars of OCESD money into July or beyond. Um, and this is at the end of 2021. Um, this is gonna be extremely difficult for Orville City Elementary to do without borrowing. Uh, we simply don't have that level of a fund balance um, to, to not have cash. Uh, and additionally, when we look at our other funds, uh, there's only so much fund you know, borrowing we can do. And you know, it simply doesn't cover the $5 million that they're gonna be grabbing out um, and holding on to for, for three months. So the, we're gonna be watching cash extremely closely. We're gonna be watching this deferral extremely closely. I'm hopeful that, you know, as sick as it sounds, you hope that maybe it's just the June to July of deferral, not a April, May and June to July deferral, uh, which is gonna, gonna effectively, um, without short-term borrowing, if it goes as planned, um, you know, you would you would instantly bankrupt districts across the California because most districts can't can't afford three months of deferral. I mean, it's a whole a whole quarter of the year um, that they're not going to pay you, and that's your main your main funding source. So we'll be watching cash very carefully. I've been doing cash flow analysis, um, you know, every, every week or so, and I've been working with the county to make sure we're in good cash shape for this first deferral, and we are. So we're we can breathe easy for a little bit. Um, so when we talk about the 10% reduction, um, you know, we talked about the $2.4 million and that, that's the funding that we receive on our, a base grant level. And this slide shows the 10% reduction. Um, and this is just the base money we receive per ADA. We also receive significant money per ADA for supplemental and concentration grant funding. And that would make up the, the difference between, you know, if we took our ADA times about 800 um, to be, you know, some 1.8 million, and then the rest would be what we lose in supplemental and concentration grant funding. Uh, so what, what this equates to when your budget is about 90% uh, salaries and benefits is we're going to have to really be looking hard at what are the long-term things we can do, uh, cuts we can make, uh, strategies we can use, to save money. Um, it's going to be pretty dire. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you hate to see a, a per person cost to this and we're hoping to, you know, not fill positions and do things like that right now. Additionally, I would urge the, the budget or the, the board to remember that, you know, if we make a cut now, it lasts and it, it, you know, duplicates every year. So a cut this year of $100,000 Next year, at the end, bottom line, it saved us $200,000. And the third year, it has saved us $300,000. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, I, this is not the first time I've been through major cuts. Um, I've been through the, the major cuts back in six, seven. Or, and uh, it's not, not a pretty thing, and it's not my favorite thing to be talking about. Um, but we're going to have to make some really hard decisions as a board and as a, as a district. And we're looking at you know every option that we can take, um, but cuts are going to have to come in order to afford this. Um, one of the things I wanted to to touch on, uh, you, you see the where in there's the like a, a brown box that says these reductions would be triggered off. A triggered off is a new term uh, that Governor Newsom has come up with, and this would be if the federal government were to provide us with some stimulus money uh, like they did for the CARES Act. Um, for the CARES Act, we received about $880,000 that you know, effectively is going to have to go to the bottom line. Uh, it's not you know, new money for new things. It's, it's money just to kind of get us through 
the uh, 2021 school year. Um, so the, the triggered off has to do with the HEROES Act uh, that, that is you know, coming out of the uh, federal house and going to Senate. Um, so we'll, we'll see if, if things get triggered off. If things get triggered off, we're in much better shape, uh, at least temporarily, because the federal government doesn't typically give you ongoing money when it comes to stimulus. Some of the things that are gonna be helpful for our budget um, in what Governor Newsom has proposed were reductions to the increases or reductions overall to the PERS and STRS employer contribution rates. Overall, the changes in these rates just in 2021 will save us about $350,000 a year. Uh, some of the other things that Governor Newsom has given us in our tool bag for um, dealing with this type of a cut. Um, we can get exemption from deferrals for hardship reasons. And I, I, I think a lot of districts are gonna be there next year if they're, they're in place the way he's written them. Um, there's some other you know, little things like the ability to exclude states on behalf of employer payments is a, you know, it's not really that big of a, for our district, not gonna be that big of a thing. Uh, we can do it, but it's not going to save us a ton of money. Um, you know, you can enter fund borrow more. You can use the proceeds from the property sales for one-time general fund purposes. Um, you know, as we're seeing as we're going through the sale of different properties, that's not a short-term or quick or easy type of way to raise cash. Um, so that would have to stick around in the budget for a while, a few years, for anybody to really take adv advantage of it. Because typically school districts don't have turnkey properties to sell. Um, you know, they talk about you know some other small things. Uh, when we had the, the the big cuts a few years ago, over ten years ago now, um, we were given a lot more tools in our tool bag that were more effective. Uh, some of the things like class size penalties. Uh, currently, we receive a penalty if our class sizes aren't on, on point, um, but that hasn't been touched. Um, we look at the local control funding formula that we have to continue to fund and operate with our supplemental and concentration dollars. Uh, when we had the last round of cuts like this, we were able to take any non-core essential program money and sweep them into the core essential program. Um, so we weren't given any latitude like that with local control funding formula and the LCAP. Uh, so I'm really looking for and hoping that when the budget is ultimately passed by the legislature and as they kind of get more information together, that we're going to have some better tools to help mitigate the problems. Because right now the, the tools, the only tools we really have are just cut, cut, cut. Um, last little thing and just save some good news. For the end, we uh, did receive our restart grant. The federal government funded a, a grant uh, where we'll receive uh, $250,000 for power generation up at Ophir. So I'm hopeful that using that money, we'll be able to get, get the lights kept on at Ophir for the fall when we're going through the PSPS events, which we know are going to be happening. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's really positive and hopefully that'll help help uh, our teachers and our students at Ofer um, for a lot of years as we go through this PSPS process. Um, other than that, that, those are my comments. I uh, wish I had good news and I'll be bringing you uh, a lot more uh, in-depth, in-detail information at the, the later of the two June board meetings if we're having to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing all day, every day, dealing with that. So Andrew, this, um, thank you for that. Um, um, I guess not thank you for the information, but thank you for the information. I'm very conflicted there, but thank you. I do appreciate um, the work that you're doing on that. Um, John, I, I just had a question, one question. Uh, do you have any um, feel yet either from um, our school district or what you've heard um, other school districts on what parents, what's coming back from those surveys, blended, 
come to classroom completely uh, uh, yeah, all distance learning. I mean, I, and you may not, I just was curious. I can speak to that right now, Pamela. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I'm the one who's kind of, you know, the, the tech guy on the survey. Um, right now we have about 283 parent, parental responses. And when we talk about just the one question about which, you know, which option would you prefer, traditional distance learning or blended? Right now we have about 71% who would prefer traditional, 11% who would prefer distance learning, and about 18% would prefer a blended model. Uh, this is, I think, you know, when we originally start seeing these numbers, um, we were a little bit surprised uh, how many people were, you know, more than 25% of people would prefer to have a blended or hybrid or distance learning model for the fall. Um, so we're, we're waiting for more responses to come in and we're also gonna be sending out uh, a, a robocall at some point uh, to try to get, get more apparent responses uh, so we can get more information. We also have a lot of you know, questions where they can fill in, you know, fill stuff in. And, and I, we're hopeful that once we have the survey completed that we'll be able to share some of the, some of the macro data uh, publicly and you know, as, in, in a board presentation as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, at this time, um, I'd like to open it up. Uh, it's 5C on the agenda, comments by the public. Um, like to ex The board would like to extend an invitation to interested parties who wish to speak on matters that are school board related, or sorry, school related. Email your comments or questions to backpack at ocesd.net. That's backpack, B-A-C-K-P-A-C-K -A -A at ocesd.net. Please include your first and last name in your email. Comments and questions will be read into the record and addressed during the meeting. However, emails received without a sender's name will not be shared during the meeting. The Brown Act does not allow the governing board to discuss or take action on any item that is not posted on the agenda. And I believe we have both Spencer and Andrew are, are, are monitoring emails. That is correct. Uh, we have no emails that came in, but I did receive a text message um, <clears throat> about one of the agenda items coming up. I wanted to, uh, to share with you because it's gonna affect what we're doing. Aaron Benton, the director of the Butte County SELPA uh, asked that we pull the fencing, the two fencing items from our agenda and move them to our June board meeting. Uh, they must have some kind of, uh, you know, procedural thing going on. Um, so those are items under facilities 10, C and D. Uh, that's the only public comment I have at this time. Uh, Pamela, we have uh, Michael Williamson who is on our feed and he would like to make a comment at this time. Great, thank you. Hello, board. Um, given what Andrew's just explained and where we're headed with potential cuts to all of our staff, um, at this time, I'd, I'd like to offer that my stipend not be awarded for the uh, personnel director position. I'd like to continue to serve in that position if, if the board wills it, but uh, I'd like to ask at this time not to be uh, compensated for it. Michael, I appreciate all the work um, that you're doing and, and, and stepping up. Uh, I don't know that I have another comment um, on that. Uh, Spencer, do you have any comment on that? Uh, I, I will say that um, Michael does a great job for us at Central School as our principal there, and he's a valuable asset to our administrative team. and. I certainly appreciate him um, willingness to continue to support other principals and sites and myself in this position without compensation. Um, and um, we really are grateful for, for that. I can echo that. I, I, am, I am grateful. I, I always hesitate to ask people um, to do work without pay. And, and um, 
I certainly hope that you're getting something back from us, Michael, for this. Um, I do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Spencer or Andrew, were there any other comments that came in? No, there were not. No. Okay, if we can move on to agenda, agenda item number six, the public hearing. Um, the first one is the developer, uh, developer fee justification study. Uh, we would be, um, we're looking for, the study includes justification for increasing the amounts collected for residential and commercial industrial construction projects within the district's boundaries. I'm not sure Andrew or um, Dr. Holton who wants to, um, who would like to speak further on that. I, I can speak to this. Thank you. Um, as you know, Oroville City Elementary School District collects developer fees um, and we have been saving those developer fees and hope to, uh, you know, redo the Stanford parking lot with those developer fees. This coming to the board, this um, public notice, and you'll have a chance later on to vote whether you approve it or not, um, is the increase from the 2018 developer fees to the 2020 level developer fees. The developer fees were 379 for residential and 61 cents for commercial, and that's per square foot. Um, and they're going up to $4.08 for residential and 66 cents for commercial per square foot. Uh, this is the uh, a result of the state changing the rates. So we're just following the state's rates, but when you do that, you still have to go through the whole process of putting this in the paper, notifying all of the agencies, having a public hearing and having the board approve this as well. It's, it's not something that just automatically happens. And so that's what this is. This is us raising the rates to the January 2020 rates uh, that everybody else in the state is going to be collecting. Andrew, did you say the January 2020 or uh, raising or the January 2021? Um, January 2020 is when the uh, inflation adjustment occurred so that it'll, it'll begin as soon as we uh, make it so. Thank you. Action item number, I guess, item number seven on the agenda's presentation. It's the feasibility of placing a facilities obligation bond measure on the November ballot. I understand that we may have uh, John, uh, um, Isom and Associates and Jones Hall with us. Yes, um, Madam President, we have Katie Dobson and Makiko Sato. Did I say that right? Yep, you did. Okay, um, uh, with us, and they're going to present um, to us. We have asked them to come tonight. Um, if you remember, board and community uh, last year, we had them come and do some surveying in our area uh, regarding the, the possibility of putting a um, bond in on our November ballot, and we've asked them to come back and talk to us and give the board an opportunity to ask them questions because so much has changed um, since the last time we, we spoke with them, including our economy. And so uh, we want to give everybody opportunity to ask them questions and vet this process um, and, and decide whether or not we uh, ultimately want to move forward or not. So uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you, Superintendent Holtem. Um, I actually recall being at uh, Ishii Middle School last year for the retiree appreciation ceremony, which is very nice. So it must be, uh, you know, just um, a year that we've been working with the district um, planning for a possible bond election uh, for the November 2020 ballot. Um, if this were a typical election year, um, the board would have probably voted on a resolution calling the bond election earlier this month or at this board meeting. However, as you know, we've, uh, 2020 has been anything but typical. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, we got in touch with um, Superintendent Holtem and with Mr. James um, and decided it made sense to provide an update to the board and perhaps revisit our options at this point. Um, I wanted to begin by um, sharing some information about the March 2020 election. 
um, there were 121 school and community college district bond measures on the ballot in March 2022 throughout California. Um, and of those 121, only 44 were successful. Um, so that puts the success rate at around 36%, which is substantially lower than the passage rates we've seen in past elections, which is around two thirds. Um, we're also beginning to see the economic impact of the coronavirus situation. Um, April unemployment figures um, in California, broken down by region, are coming out this Friday. Um, and you know everything we're hearing, we expect them to be pretty high. Um, and as you can imagine, support for new tax measures tend to go down um, as voters feel less comfortable committing to a tax increase when they may not be feeling financially secure themselves. Um, I do want, you know, I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Um, you know, I think even over the last couple of weeks, we've seen uh, people's thinking about the coronavirus shift a little bit. Um, certainly from a bond market perspective, things have settled down quite a bit in May. Um, we're also seeing parts of, you know, the state reopening. Um, this November is also a presidential election, which typically mean higher turnout, which is often good news for bond measures. So how are other schools handling this, other schools considering, uh, you know, bond measures? Um, some school districts are moving forward full steam ahead. Um, some school districts have decided to not pursue a bond election at this time. They feel that it, it would be, um, you know, difficult to do in the middle of a pandemic. Um, given everything that's going on, that's definitely um, a reasonable option to consider. Um, another option that some school districts are looking at is to just put the bond measure on the ballot without spending money on a campaign. The idea here would be just to put it on the ballot and let the voters decide if they're comfortable um, with the bond measure. If it passes, that's great. If not, you know, the district can still go out in 2022 again. Um, which is the next opportunity for a Prop 39 bond election. So tonight, this is not an action item. Um, the board doesn't need to make any decisions. Um, in Butte County, the deadline to submit a resolution um, to get on the November ballot is in early July. So um, I think it makes sense um, to, for the board to you know, keep thinking about this to the end of June. Um, you know, I think it's possible that there'll be new information that comes out between now and the end of June. Maybe there wouldn't be, but you know, just in case it would be, it, I think it makes sense to incorporate as much information as you can into your decision. Um, just in case the board does wanna to continue to move forward, um, Jones Hall has put together a draft bond resolution and Katie's here to you know, talk um, through that um, if the board is interested. But before we do that, I was just going to pause here to see if um, the board had any questions or uh, comments that they wanted to share. I have a question. It's Mark. Do, uh, do we know the price, uh, what it would cost? To... Yes, Katie's actually been in touch with the county and their rough estimate, it's still pretty early. Um, is that it may cost somewhere between twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars to put a ballot, um, a bond measure on the ballot this November, but it depends to some extent. And Katie, feel free to jump in. Um, I, I think it depends on you know, if there are other um, items on the on the ballot. Exactly. So if there are a number of other measures, then the cost would go down because you would share that with the other entities who are placing things on the ballot, but. It's just too early for the county to know how many different items will be on the ballot. So 25 to 30 was their best guess for right now. I do wanna share with, with the board that um, this, because it's a presentation um, and we, uh, as they shared, you know, we won't be taking any action on it tonight. This is a good time that um, and open that you can kind of share your thoughts with the other board members, with um, administration, and and with with our consultants um, to kind of talk it through. Um, I know back last year we were very much um, in favor of moving forward, as was I. Um, I do have a lot of trepidation now with the economy and um, with the fact that. What we're looking at is an increase in taxing uh, taxes for our community at a time that's um, 
not advantageous. Um, but at the same time, on the other side of the coin is the fact that we have aging facilities um, and some safety issues that um, through facility improvements would, would vastly improve. And so I'm, I'm very much um, could side with, with either side because th there, there's a lot of good points on, on both sides of the coin. We need this, but at the same time, the timing is, is not optimal. So um, at this time, if you have any other questions, now is the, now is the time to discuss or ask them. Um, this is Pamela Hamilton. Could somebody remind me what uh, dollar amount we were talking about? I was looking through my notes and I just can't find it. Yeah, let me pull that up. Um, it was a $30 per $100,000 tax rate is the maximum. I think we were looking at 19.2 million. Yeah, that makes sense with the $30 tax rate, $30 per $100,000 in assessed value. Thank you. And the other option that we had um, that we talked about um, prior is uh, we looked at different um, bond levels. Well, I think one that was a little bit more than 19 million. And then I think we also talked about one that was uh, less than 19 million, which of course brings um, that $30 per assessed 100,000 on property would, would bring that, that number down. Um, yes. So um, it, with a $25 per $100,000 um, in assessed value tax rate, um, total proceeds would go down to about 16 million. Um, if we wanted to look at a $19 tax rate for $100,000 in assessed value, the total bond proceeds will be about 12 and a half million. So, the district could certainly consider a lower authorization amount with corresponding lower tax rate impact. I guess, again, this is Pamela. I guess the, the only, it's, it's the same concerns that everybody else. I'm not, you know, sort of everybody gets the same information is, you know, between the campfire, which was just, you know, so which we all believe is driving up PG&E rates. And, and this, I, it, it seems a little, um, I don't know that this is good timing. So I, this is my initial thoughts on it. Anyone else? Any, yeah, anyone else? Okay, Any um, anything else from either Katie or, and, and was it Makaya? Kiko. No. Makiko. Sorry, Makiko. No, not at all. Anything no. else from the two of you? Um, no, so in terms of next steps, perhaps um, we'll be in touch with Superintendent Oldham um, in the next week or so to see if um, there's any direction uh, from the board on how to proceed. Uh, does that sound like a good plan? That, that sounds like a good plan. And I, I will um, re reach out and um, get a better sense of what direction we'd like to go. And then um, we'll get back to you because we do know that if we, we are to move forward with this, this, this would need to be um, become an action item um, mm -hmm. next month. Um, and so I know the timing is, is important. So we'll be, we'll be in touch. Sure. And I just want to also mention if there's any additional questions that come up, please, you know, be in touch with the superintendent uh, or with Andrew and um, we, we can answer anything that comes up later. Thank you. I appreciate right, thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if we'd like to go ahead and move on to um, item eight on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Um, minutes of uh, uh, part A is minutes of the April 8th, uh, 2020 regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Are there any comments or uh, about this from any of the 
the board? Um, I have a concern um, concerning one of the board policies towards the end, it's the second to last one. Um, I think it uh, is on the consent agenda. Yeah. Let me get but, let me get through it and, and let me get through each one and then we'll quit. Yeah, and we'll take care of that. So if there's no no comments on the minutes, we'll go to section B, minutes of the May 6, 2020 special meeting of the board of trustees. Any comments from our board members? Madam President, if I could just offer, could I make a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item M? Um, that Ms. Barnes is concerned about. That way we don't have to go through item by item if nobody has any comments on any of the other items. Brilliant, thank you. Is there a second for that? Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. I think we have to do a roll call vote because of the connectivity of uh, the way we're Thank you, Bill, and we'll be do that. Uh, I, I appreciate the, um, Bill, we'll start with you, Bill. Um, in yes. favor yes. or opposed? Yes. Um, Art? Yes. Uh, Mark? Aye. Sandra? Aye. Uh, I am an aye, and Dr. Holtum? I, I, don't, I don't vote. Okay, great. And that motion will carry, and then we will go back and look at item number uh, uh, M, the first reading of the revised board policy 6171 Title I programs. Go ahead, Sandra, you had some um, concerns that you want to bring up? Um, what I had a question on, I'm not sure if it's on this one, I apologize. Um, concerning preschools, we're endeavoring to have preschools and yet there is a piece where it completely removes the standards of education for preschools entirely without providing any alternative. I'm sorry, Sandra, do you know which policy that language is in? I apologize, I had it and I lost it in all of the fun stuff that we we're trying to get used to. Student assessments, Title I programs, AR 6171, N. John, are, are you looking at that right now? I'm trying to. So AR 6171, do you know about where the, te the text is that you're concerned about? Um. Targeted assistance programs. I will say that it's in the if it's in the if it's in the targeted assistance programs, we don't have any school sites that are targeted assistance, so it doesn't apply to our district. All of ours are school wide. Okay. Okay, uh, it says uh, letter E under four, four E, strategies for assisting preschools children in the transition from early childhood education program to local elementary schools. 
And then it says measures including teachers in decisions regarding the use of academic assessment to provide information to improve achievement of individual students and overall instruction programs and activities to ensure that students who experience difficulties mastering proficiency, it's just gone. So I, it's there, but there's no substance. It says that we're it? supposed to have strategies for assisting preschool children, but all the what? strategies have been removed. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it still. So, so I know it's hard to find. Yeah, what I'm, especially with this distance learning kind of going back and forth. Um, Madam President, what I would recommend that we do is that um, we just pull this item and that um, Mr. Bohannon and, and I will work with um, Ms. Barnes and see if we can um, look at that language and, and bring that back so that we can resolve any concerns that we have there. I don't, um, I think that would be a, a better use of um, our time given the fact that our technology is difficult um, in this virtual war world. I had it pulled up and then I lost it, so. Um. May I speak to this for a moment? <clears throat> Please. Um, we use what is called the Desired Results Developmental Profile or the DRDP. Um, that is administered twice a year to the preschool students. That is a state submitted, um, it goes to our SELPA and then it goes to the state. Um, so that is an assessment that we are making sure that the children are developing at a desired rate. If it shows that the children are not, then in the preschool um, arena, that assessment is used to modify the instruction and to give additional support. So the DRDP is not going to leave. It's a state mandated uh, assessment. Okay, so I guess my question is, if we're not going to have any strategy outside of the state mandated, why do we have a section E for, for that anyway? So I, I think I found what you're talking about, section E, where it says strategies for assisting preschool yeah. children in the transition from early childhood. Um, so I think the reason is, is because we are, the board is requiring us to have those strategies, but they're not specifying what the strategies are if we approve the policy the way it is. And the, the actual strategies would be found in our admin reg, regulation that would back up the board policy, I believe. So I think that, I think we don't, okay. I think we're just saying we have to have strategies, but they're not specified as to what those strategies are. As a local LEA, we get to decide those. Okay, awesome. Going up. So in other words, we didn't put anything in this board policy that wasn't ed code. And then anything that we want to supplement it with the ARs and supplement it as the administrators would decide what those strategies are with their teachers. Awesome. Thank you. Sandra, are you, are you comfortable with that um, explanation? Yeah, it, it's just troubling. We keep talking about having a preschool of our own and then you know, strategies for supporting that, you know, are just in great, just completely crossed out entirely. And without that knowledge that we do have a catch all for, you know, a state mandated requirement for that in the first place, it's just, it's troubling. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, can I get a, uh, a um, motion to approve um, item M on the consent, on the consent agenda? So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Um, and we'll go through a roll call vote. Art? Yes. Uh, Mark? Yes. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Yes. I, that'll be yes from Pamela. Um, and the uh, motion carries. We're going to move on to item number nine on the agenda, new business. Um, a is to set a public hearing date for the 2021 district budget review and adoption. So this is a little different than in prior years. Um, 
because the LCAP is no longer is not required to go with the budget, the budget does not have to have a separate public hearing meeting um, in early June. So this is just um, you know, the, the meeting for adoption of the original budget and the public hearing will be at the same meeting. Board, any questions or comments? Great, we'll do a roll call. Uh, oh, my God, sorry, may I get a motion um, to um, set a public hearing date for the 2021 district budget and review and adoption? I'll make a motion we approve the item as agendized with the dates that are listed on the agenda. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Great. Roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Aye. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And uh, Pamela Hamilton is an aye. The uh, motion carries. Item B on new business, approve the declaration of need for fully qualified educators. Um, who wants to speak with that? I'll, I'll, that I'll speak, yeah, I'll speak to that. That is a declaration um, that we do every year with, with the county and the state. This allows us to um, hire intern eligible teachers that are currently in a program with um, Chico State University. This allows us, if we cannot find a fully credentialed um, person for a position, it allows us to hire an intern um, if we need to. We typically have not hired a, a lot of interns. This sets a limit on how many interns we could um, hire, which is five, we could not hire more than five in special ed or five in, um, you know, the multiple subject area. And so it just allows us the flexibility to do that. We certainly try not to hire interns because we want fully credentialed people, but occasionally in hard to find positions like special ed, it's nice to have that as an option. Thank you for that. Um, can I get a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, board, any questions that you have on this? Uh, Madam President, I do have one question. At the bottom of that document, it asks, does your agency participate in a commission approved college or university internship program? And then underneath it, it says yes, but the little box that says yes is not check marked. Okay. Um, and I think, um, and the answer to that is yes. Um, we can we can amend that. Um, and underneath that box, it does it does list Chico State University as the only um, university that is able to um, be part of this program. Thank you for that. Um, may I get a motion to? Uh, approve um, item B on the new business, approve the declaration of need for fully qualified educators with the amendment as discussed, uh, making sure that we have all of our I's, our T crossed and our I's dotted and our box boxes checked. So moved. And a second, please. Second. Thank you. And we'll do a roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Yes. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And Pamela Hamilton is an aye. We, uh, the motion, so moved, the motion carries. Uh, so item C under new business, approve the annual statement of need. It is recommended that this annual statement of need for 30 day uh, substitute and designated subjects, uh, career technical education, 30 day substitute teaching permits for the 2020 2021 school year be approved as presented. Is there someone who would like to speak to that?
sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, yes, I'll, I'll speak to that. That This is uh, another waiver that we do on an annual basis. And this is uh, regarding our substitutes and the 30-day waiver um, within that process. Uh, John, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Um, uh, but it, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say I was going to say not really, but thanks for putting me on the spot. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, th this has to do with uh, CTE, which is career technical education as well. We don't really uh, involve ourselves being a K-8 into that um, in that area, but we still do this um, regarding a, a 30 day permute permit um, within our process. Yeah, it just gives the district the leeway to do that if necessary. It doesn't mean they'll actually use it. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, I'd like at this point um, to, if I could get a uh, a motion to a to approve the um, annual statement of a need. So moved. And a second. Second. And we're going to do a roll call vote on this. Art? Aye. Mark? Aye. Did we lose Pam? Sandra? Aye. Pamela's an aye, and I'll try Bill Legrone one more time. Aye. Aye, thank you. Uh, the uh, vote carries, uh, the motion carries, um, thank you. We're gonna move to number 10 on the, on the agenda, which is facilities. I see Jim Galloway's on. Uh, this is accepting a bid for the roofing project at Ofer School. Uh, is, is that, uh, Dr. Holtzman, do we want, uh, would we like Jim to um, speak y to yes, this? Yes, please. Jim, are you available? Jim, go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, this is for the, uh, uh, for the office building at Ofer School. And uh, if you see the bids, the bids, there's quite a disparity in the bids, but the, um, Low bidder, George Roofing, has done a tremendous amount of work for the district over the years and has well understood the scope of the project, so I'm not concerned about it, where I normally might be seeing that disparity in bids, but that's the project. Pamela, you're on mute. There we go. I was having trouble. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Jim. Uh, at this time, uh, the board, does any board have, member have a question for Jim? All right. At this time, I'd like to, uh, if I could get a motion to accept the bids for the roofing project at Ofer School. I'll make that motion. Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. And we'll do a roll call vote. Art? Art, you're on mute. Still on mute. There, Art. there we go. There we go. There go. Aye. Thank you. Mark? Aye. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And uh, myself, I am a yes. Uh, the motion carries. And we will move on to. Uh, uh, Is it me or did we lose Pamela again? We lost Pamela again. Lost Pamela again. Yeah, we got no audio from Pamela. Okay, am I gone? She's back. No. I'm back. Okay, sorry. The motion carried. That's where I was. And uh, Jim, would you like to speak uh, or to make the recommendation on item B uh, to award the contract for the roofing project at Ofer School? Well, I would like to see the bid go to George Riffing, who's the low bidder. 
Great questions, um, board. At this point, can I get a motion to award the contract to George Roofing, uh, the uh, low bidder? So moved. May I get a second? Second. And we'll do a roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Yes. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And myself is a yes, the motion carries. At this point, we are going to um, skip, or we're going to place on it, and probably the June agenda, it looks like the item C and item D, which are uh, surrounding the fencing project at Eastside School. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. If we can move on to uh, item 11 on the agenda, which is business and finance. Um, accept the developer fee justification study. So this is uh, back to the developer fee justification study from earlier. This is one of two things. Um, first, you accept the developer fee justification study in this um, motion. And the next motion, you adopt the resolution increasing the school facility fees based on the developer fee justification study. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, board members, any questions for Andrew? I think we lost Pamela again. Pamela, are you back with us? Do we need more time to review this? We, 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 lost or, you for a second. we lost you for a second, Pamela. I am so sorry. I don't know why my video is doing that or why that's doing it. I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll stop the video here in a second. Um, may I get a, um, a motion to approve the, uh, to accept, sorry, the, the developer fee justification statement? So moved. May I get a second? Second. We'll take a roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Aye. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And Pamela is an aye. We're gonna move on. It looks like we have, um, it looks like we didn't have any discussion or any questions. Uh, may I get a motion to adopt resolution yeah, 19-20-07, increasing the school facility fees as authorized by government code section 65995B3. Did you guys lose me again? Motion to approve. Thank you. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Yes. Thank you. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And I am an aye as well, or yes, uh, the motion passes. Item C on uh, business and finance, approve the interdistrict agreement with Orville Union High School District. These are developer fees. Um, Andrew or Dr. Holton, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I'll speak to it real quick. Um, because we split the district, you know, we have, we're the, the K-8 portion and the high school is the 9-12 portion. We also split the developer fees. Um, if we were to in, if we were to separately collect all these developer fees, it makes for a pretty good burden for our, our, our people of, of Oroville. Um, so what we've done and have done traditionally through the past many, many years is Oroville High School collects all the developer fees and forwards the rest, you know, forwards our portion onto us. And we pay them, I think, 3% um, as an admin fee for, for the trouble. Um, from my perspective, it's been very worthwhile. Uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of you know people coming in your office and having questions. Um, 
So I would ask that the board approve this again. Questions from the board? At this time, I would like to get a motion from the board to approve the interdistrict agreement with Orville Union High School District for developer fees. I'll make a motion we approve the item as agenda. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. And we'll do a roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Aye. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And Pamela is a yes. The motion carries. We're moving on to section 12 of the agenda personnel uh, to approve uh, the military leave of absence request is recommended that a leave of absence request be approved for Spencer. Is it good? Ansorgi? Ansorgi? Ansorgi, yep. Yeah, you got it right. Thank you. SL, SEL teacher at Central Middle School and it'd be effective for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, Spencer, did you have any additional information you'd like to provide us? Uh, no, I think we talked a little bit about this earlier. This is going to be a one-year leave. Um, he is allotted up to 180 days um, from, the, from the school year. And um, effectively, half this year, he's going to go to um, formal training, and the other half will be um, kind of exercises and, and getting them adjusted um, into what he would be doing in um, the military field. So uh, we anticipate one year and then he'll be back with us after that. And I think uh, the plan is that once he's back with us, he'll go into um, the, re the reserves so that he would be back teaching um, most of the time. Thank you for that board. Any questions? May I get a motion uh, to approve item A um, under personnel? So moved. I just want to mention that I, he will be sorely missed. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Art? Aye. Mark? Yes. Bill? Yes. Sandra? Aye. And Pamela is a yes. The motion carries. Item number B under section 12 of the agenda. Consider the request for leave of absence. It is recommended that a request for a 50% leave of absence for Kately Higginbotham, teacher at Stanford Avenue School, be approved for the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, Dr. Holcomb, any uh, additional information you'd like to provide there? Uh, K Caitlin is a uh, really uh, great kindergarten teacher at Stanford. Um, but she is starting her family. She just had a baby um, a couple months ago and she would now like to go uh, part-time to um, be home more so that she can start to raise her family. Board, any questions? Right. May I get a motion to approve the a motion to consider the request for leave of absence? So moved. A second. 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 Thank you, Art. Aye. Mark. Aye. Bill. Yes. Sandra. Aye. And Pamela's yes, the motion carries. Item C, consider the job share proposal. Um, it again, is, this is uh, dealing with Caitlin Higginbotham um, for the 2020-2021 school year that a 50-50 job share teaching assignment at Stanford Avenue School uh, be approved. Uh, any discussion, uh, or sorry, uh, Dr. Holtzman, anything further you would like to add here? Uh, we, we have found a teacher that um, would like to job share um, with her, and it's a uh, fully credentialed teacher, and we think it would be a, a very good fit uh, for not only um, the kids, but 
for the two parties involved, meaning the teachers. And so I uh, recommend that we approve. Brilliant. Board, any, any further questions? Okay, at this time I'd like to, if I could get a motion to consider the uh, job share, uh, yes, the job share proposal item C. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote, Art. Aye. Mark. Aye. Bill. Yes. Sandra. Aye. And that's an aye from me as well. The motion carries. At this time, I think we need to adjourn into closed session to take the vote. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Okay, give me just one minute. Thank you.